Welcome everyone. We're here in Boston today at the home of legendary printing industry guru Frank Romano. We invite you to take a look at some of the interesting printing memorabilia and collectibles in his private home library. Hi, I'm Frank Romano. Welcome to my little library. Well, it's not so little anymore, but for 53 years I've been collecting books and memorabilia about the printing industry. As you know, I work in the future of the industry in inkjet and digital technology but I'd love to look back at how we used to do things. This is one of the rarest things I have. This is a leaf from the Nuremberg Chronicle, 1493. It was the first publication to ever mention Gutenberg. They interviewed one of his workmen, uh, Ulrich Zell, who had his own printing company. Um, the first version was in Latin. A few years later, they did one in German. So extremely rare. This is one leaf from that publication. It was a history of the world up to that point in time. and. Uh, mostly pictures uh, or illustrations of popes, but lots of line drawings. And one of the first publications where they actually ran the type around the illustration. Extremely rare. The other uh, interesting thing I have is about the same time, Nicholas Jensen um, had moved to uh, Venice and had set, set up a printing company, and he designed the world's first serif typeface. In fact, it was the model for every serif typeface that would ever exist. And this is a leaf from a, a Jensonian Bible that was done at that time. So I've been collecting this material for years, and it goes beyond uh, a print. I also have, uh, you ready for this? This is a Newton. This was the uh, first personal digital assistant, came out from Apple uh, in the uh, late 80s, early 90s. Um, by the way, it died in 2000. <laughs> it didn't have a program that would handle anything after that. Um, this is only the assistant, by the way. The power supply and the modem actually weigh more and take up more space. But it was very interesting that as you wrote on it with a stylus, uh, with your handwriting, it translated it into text. And it was, again, way ahead of its time. But certainly not something you're going to carry around in your pocket. The most interesting thing is the original artwork for Gaudi's last typeface. Um, it's dated 1940, but 1944, 1945, he was, in his, he was just hitting 80 years old. And Lanson Monotype commissioned him to do a typeface. They figured it would be a great text face. But what he did was he went back and he dusted off a font that they had actually turned down years before. And it was more a display face than a text face. And they paid him a lot of money for it. And he said, take it or leave it. And so this became Gaudi 30. And the reason it's called Gaudi 30 was 30 was the symbol in the newspaper industry, meaning the end of a story or the end. And they said it was Gaudi's last typeface. Um, it didn't sell at all. And so original drawings by Gaudi of all of his characters. So again, there are probably 2,000 books here. There are another 2,000 in, in the warehouse. But almost anything you can imagine about the history of the printing industry from the Penrose Annual to a complete set of the inland printers, the first magazine for printing that was ever published, started in 1883. I always thought there were others over in Germany that were earlier, but no, inland printer was the first magazine that the printing industry ever saw. If we if reported on the, the invention of the linotype to the invention of offset lithography uh, and beyond. So in any case, welcome to my library. My first job in the industry was in 1959, right out of high school, and I worked for the Mergenthaler Linotype Company. It was the greatest experience you could have because the company was converting from hot metal to photographic typesetting. And people were retiring after 50 years with the company. It was very paternalistic. And as a result, I got promoted very quickly and became the assistant advertising manager at the age of 24. Uh, and wrote many of the press releases, brochures, did the movies, um, all of the promotion material for this new technology that was coming along. And that's how I met some of the people who later went on to form CompuGraphic, which became one of the leading companies in photographic typesetting. But at the age of 30, I decided to go off on my own and started a magazine. There was no magazine for the printing industry. So I started TypeWorld, and that became a very successful publication. I sold it in 1990, retired, but sort of got bored. And I got a call one day, would you like to teach at RIT for a year? Well, it turned out to be more than 20 years. And it's been a wonderful experience working with young people who are really excited about getting into the printing industry. And they, they really keep you young, and I'm quite old, so it works out pretty well. So in any case, um, I retired from RIT, but I still teach on a regular basis, and I travel the world giving lectures just about anywhere. Frank, is this the magazine that you were referring to? Yes, it, it started as TypeWorld, and after I sold it, we renamed it Electronic Publishing. It was a magazine that was printed on newsprint. 
Um, after I sold it, they converted it to a glossy magazine, normal size. I always liked the, uh, the, the tabloid size because it got a lot of attention. And I always liked printing it with newspaper printers because newspapers have this wonderful sense of getting things done on time. And so we never missed an edition. We, we published twice a month um, for 30 years. Wow. And uh, never missed a deadline. Because in a newspaper, if you miss a deadline, you wait until the next day. <laughs> so it was a great experience. Okay. This is my little newspaper corner. The beginnings of newspapers were really these little flyers, if you will. And they talked mostly about shipments into a, a certain port. This is the London Gazette from 1682. It was one of the first newsletters, which became later newspapers. And I've been trying to collect them over the years. So this is one of the first. Uh, this one is from 1759. This one here is from uh, uh, 1780. You can see the size didn't change very much. Um, and, and then we go to 1814. Um, and, and right after this is when they went to a larger size. And you started to see publications then of a larger size. This is the uh, Pennsylvania Gazette. This is the publication that Benjamin Franklin started. And his, uh, his son-in-law, Benjamin Franklin Beige, continued um, after his death. Uh, this is the uh, New York Tribune. This was the first newspaper that was set with a linotype machine. And this is that issue uh, that Otmar Mergenthaler actually keyboarded in order to create the publication. So this is my little corner of rare newspapers uh, showing the evolution of the way we communicated because this was the internet of its day. Why am I holding a doorknob? In 1901, they broke ground for a building in New York City at 461 8th Avenue. It was right across from the post office and diagonally across from Pennsylvania Station. The building is still there, by the way. It's now called Five Penn Plaza. And if you look at the building from across the street, you will notice at the mezzanine level, there are all these symbols of printing industry firms. Fust and Schufer, which was actually Gutenberg, um, the, the oldest symbol of the, uh, the anchor and the dolphin. And it was the printing crafts building. It was the first building ever built in the world to house multiple printing tenants. So you could have typesetting done on one floor, printing done on another floor, and bindery done on another floor, and then it would go over to the post office to be delivered. And all of the doors had these brass doorknobs that had the initials PCB, Printing Crafts Building. PCB is not a good acronym today, but at that time it didn't matter. In any case, at one, time, at one point, CNN took over the building and they got rid of all the doors, and, as well as the doorknobs. But I rescued two doorknobs, and that's why this is a historic piece, a historic doorknob from the Printing Crafts Building. This is my collection of Penrose annuals. In 1895, a man named Gamble in England decided that he wanted to do a time capsule of everything that was happening in the printing industry. So he contacted printers all over the world, and if they were doing something interesting, he had them send him um, a, co a collection of printouts of whatever it was. And he then bound them into this publication, which was called Penrose's Pictorial Annual. And so he found those printers who were using offset lithography, those printers that were using new kinds of engraving, those that were using the new, this new process that involved halftones, and put them into these wonderful books detailing everything they did. So it's a wonderful history of the industry. And it went from 1895 to 1972. Um, I have all but the first three. So if anybody has Penrose Annual, 1895, 96, or 97, I will pay whatever you want <laughs> because they are quite rare. And they did, in, in every way, tell you what was happening in the printing industry. This is the Tribune book of Open Air Sports. This was the first book ever typeset on a linotype machine. This, again, was 1886. The Tribune had a publishing operation, and that's why they produced this book. Now, the, the, the next one is kind of weird, The Wonderful World of Insects. Now, why would I have a book on insects? Well, I really don't want a book on insects, but this was the first book that was ever typeset on a photographic typesetting machine, 1949. And uh, it, it, there's a whole page in the back that tells you about it. Uh, one of the first books that was ever published on the history of printing was in 1701. And by the way, um, th this one happens to be in English. There's another version of it in, in French. Uh, but again, there weren't many histories of printing that were done 
until we enter the, the, the 1900s as such, when Divini published his first major history of printing. 